Morning, Saints. <clears throat> Happy Sabbath. The, um, the title, uh, of course, I guess might be a little confusing, I guess, if you read it literally. Uh, the claims of Jesus, truth, or, or fabrication. It's impossible to have truth of fabrication because they're in complete diametric opposite of each other. Truth, we all know what truth is. Fabrication, lies, we all know what fabrication is. So I just wanted to make sure that you understood I was hopefully not going to be sharing anything that was confusing. And as Becky's prayer says, hopefully anything that is shared now is completely from the throne of grace. Let's just pray one more time. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be in each of our hearts right now and in my heart. We ask that each one of us will receive a unique message from you that only you know that each one of us need. And may your name be glorified only. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Of course, we all believe in Jesus. Um, Otherwise, I suspect we wouldn't be here today. We come from many different cultural backgrounds, many different religious upbringings. And I would say that just as my religious upbringing was merely cultural, so has yours. As the Bible says, unless we be born again, spiritually born again, we have no part in the kingdom of heaven. So there is a difference between cultural religion, which some of us as Seventh-day Adventists took many, many years to shed and to become spiritually reborn. But praise God that today I believe every one of us here is, believes in Jesus. But I wanted to just share from the Holy Word some of the astonishing claims that Jesus made while he walked on this world. Just so that we do not take anything for granted. There's no new truth in what I'm going to share. But I think that it's always valuable if we kind of review where Jesus started, what he said, and more importantly, what is going to be my response. So, Jesus, as we know, is not accepted by many religions of this world. Our Jewish brothers and sisters do not accept him as the Son of God, as his radical claim was indeed radical and is very radical to this day. Our Muslim brothers and sisters also do not accept that he was the Son of God. And I think that as we leave today, hopefully we will be convicted, as in our Bible study, Sabbath school lesson this morning, by the Word of God, not by my words, because my words are extremely feeble, but that we will be convicted by the Word of God as a two-edged sword that pierces into our very soul that Jesus Christ was indeed the Son of God. This is a very radical claim. And it may seem trite for me to review that today, but I think that it should have a very profound impact on your and my daily life. And that's why I wanted to share on this. Now, to me, this, if it's not easy to sum up all of what Jesus is trying to tell us. But I would think of four things. I'm God, and I have redeemed the whole sinful human race. I think that's pretty much a cornerstone of what Jesus' life and claims were. The Holy Spirit is for comfort, enlightenment of sin, and power to overcome sin. Jesus made that claim as well. Your salvation is contingent on a daily personal relationship with me, Jesus Christ. Turning you from sin, lovingly engaging in Christ's church and all humanity. 
So those are three claims Jesus has made. A fourth one, I'm sure there are about ten, I'm going to stop at four. My second coming will only happen after you, you and me, us together, working together, astonishing thought, we won't discuss that today, only happen after you have told the whole world about me and my salvation for mankind. To me, those are four things, and it's not an exhaustive list. We're only going to share number one, though. Other times, we can delve into the others. Number one, I'm God. This is what Jesus said. I am God, and I have redeemed, not you, not us, the entire human race. That was his claim. What should our response be to that claim? Well, first of all, do we believe it? And second of all, what will my actions be? Now, obviously, the life of Jesus was probably the ultimate, not the only revelation of God, but the ultimate revelation of the Father, in that he came incarnate in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, to show us God's infinite love. There's no way in this short time we have together worshiping the Lord that we can go through all of the manifestations of Jesus' love. But in summation, it was to show God's love in the physical. Obviously, his life spanned spiritual, mental. All boundaries were broken down through his life. And God's will is to redeem humanity. So, our text this morning, Jesus is telling those that were alive at his time, if I'm not doing the works of God, then it's very, the Father, then it's very easy to know that I'm not his son. But if I am doing the works of the Father, and you still don't want to believe in me, at least believe for the sake of these manifestations of righteousness. And then the second text is actually not John 5, 4, 5, and 7, although that was excellent. John 15, 4, 5, and 7. You can't go wrong, even if you get a wrong text. You just can't go wrong in the Word of God anyway. So it's, it, I, I actually, I think I like yours better. <laughs> But I'll just refer to the one that was intended when I uh, communicated to those making the bulletin. Jesus was saying, again, something quite astonishing here. We take for granted. He says, abide in me, and I will abide in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. Now, most people will not accept that, just in that verse alone. I'm strong, I have a heritage, a cultural heritage, a family heritage, I have economic position, I have uh, learnedness, I have skills and ability, and you're telling me none of this counts? And Jesus is saying, yes, none of it counts, none of it means nothing. And he's probably saying it with a tender, loving smile in his face. He's saying, I am the vine, ye are the branches, in verse 5. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. And here he again says the same thing. Without me, you can do nothing. Obviously, he's speaking in the spiritual bearing of fruit realm which is all that matters, really. Verse 7, if, if ye abide in me, as verse 4 he's asking us to do, verse 7, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, words very important, the word of God, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Do you really believe that claim right there, that last half of verse 7? 
Is it a little astonishing? I hope it's astonishing because it is to me. It constantly, the Word of God is constantly, the Word of Jesus Christ, hopefully is constantly astonishing us by its magnitude of challenge to our conventional way of life, our conventional way of thinking. So, think about Matthew chapter 7. We all like Matthew chapter 7, right? It starts with, judge not that ye be not judged. Remember where it says, don't try to take the, don't try to take the splinter out of your uh, brother's eye. Don't judge them. When you've got this huge railroad track beam coming out of your own eye, you're so blind. Very graphic words. That's Matthew chapter 7. And at the very end, and this is really the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus in uh, several chapters of Matthew, ending in Matthew 7, is telling the people the wisdom of God and how we should behave with one another, a cornerstone of Christ's life. And at the very end, the people, it says in verse 28 and 29, the people were astonished. Astonished. Isn't that interesting? Because he spoke with authority, not as the scribes. That's kind of startling, too. I mean, the scribes, they knew all about the Hebrew religion. Their job was to teach. Evidently, the people weren't so impressed with the authority of the scribes as far as their knowledge of righteousness. The Sermon on the Mount is all about righteousness. And then here the people, Matthew's writing this, right? He's an observer. He's not the only one, Mark. Mark chapter 1 says the whole thing right at the beginning of the book of Mark. The people were astonished because Jesus spoke with authority. Let's go on. Matthew chapter 13. Jesus came to his hometown. Same thing, Mark 6. He preached. In a minute, we'll talk about what Luke has to say about Jesus' preaching in the synagogue. Pretty startling. But in his hometown, the people were astonished at what he had to say. Again, Jesus was preaching and speaking with conviction and authority, unlike anyone else. But yet in his hometown, they did not want to believe him. Because, well, we know his mother and father. We know his sisters and brothers. What is this? He's, he's not some learned, you know, priest. He's not a leader in the Pharisee, Sadducee, Sanhedrin. How can he speak with such authority? So the stage was set for a level of attention that Jesus was getting that was creating controversy, making tremendous statements of wisdom and then very quick on that he starts making tremendous claims about himself we know that even before his ministry started as a 12 year old he was in the temple and somewhat predictive of three days in the grave, it seems like for three days he was lost by his mother and father. I think that should be impossible. There's not a one of us in this day and age would, that would let our children out of our sight for three minutes. For three days he was out of the sight of his parents. I guess times have changed. And he says, I'm about my father's business. Even his mother and father didn't understand that claim. But it was a foretelling. And very quickly, we come to one of the most astonishing stories in the Bible, Luke chapter 4. Actually, starting with verse 18, going on a number of verses down. Read this in your own time. Luke chapter 4, read this. Because again, Jesus, after being in the wilderness for 40 days, fasting 40 days and 40 nights, we all know about the three major temptations that the devil himself brought to Jesus. And Jesus was able to overcome by the Word of God, reciting the Word of God. So then Jesus comes in to town, 
He comes to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. To this day, Jews are very upset about this. He comes in and they give him the scriptures of Isaiah to read. He stands up and he reads Isaiah chapter 61. Instead of reading all of the predictions of Isaiah chapter 61, predictions of future salvation, he reads the first two verses and then he sit, he, before he sits down he says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your presence. Very dramatic. In other words, he was telling them, I am the fulfillment of this scripture. Startling. Nothing passive about this man, Jesus Christ. Nothing passive about him at all. I think it would offend any culture in this day and age. His confidence, his authority in this claim. Today, your special heritage of a coming salvation, I'm the fulfillment of it. There must have been some murmuring, it's not real clear. But then he went on, not very politically correct either. He really stuck them right in the heart, the Jewish people. And here he's Jewish. I don't understand, but he decided he was going to nail this right down to the floor or whatever analogy you want to use. Because he went on to tell them that in the days of Elijah, when there was famine and there was death and there was tremendous destruction to life for Israel when Ahab was king, that God sent Elijah somewhere else out of Israel to bless someone that was not even of their heritage. I didn't say it very offensively, but apparently he said it so offensively to them in the house of worship on their Sabbath that they literally became so incensed that they carried him out of the church and they wanted to throw him over the cliff, but of course, miraculously, the Bible tells us that he just walked right through the crowd and walked away. Are we starting to get a sense of what Jesus Christ, his ministry, started? That's how it started, with a bang, a massive bang, extremely disruptive. Extremely disruptive to any cultural sensitivity of his own people. He didn't go to a foreign country and become rude and confrontational. His own people. They would consider this. Obviously, they wanted to kill him. A few other examples. In uh, John chapter 5, verse 36, read this later. <clears throat> I have greater witnesses than that of John, meaning John the Baptist. Even greater witnesses. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. Very quickly in the book of John, verse five, chapter 5, the Father has sent me. It's amazing that he lived for three and a half years, considering what he was telling the Jewish people. It was not easy to swallow. Think of the fact that Jesus fed 4,000 people, 5,000 people, miraculously with nothing. He healed all manner of physical ailments. He raised the dead, cast out demons. He walked on water, controlled the weather, and controlled the physical ailments, cursed the fig tree, and it withered right there on the spot. So we all accept these things, but unfortunately there are others, our brothers and sisters, who do not. Good to review so we can share, hopefully humbly, to confirm the divinity of Jesus. And of course, he wasn't satisfied with that. He wanted to heal on the Sabbath and confront the hypocrisy. Pardon me for using my index. I'm trying to move over to the thumb. And confront the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. 
Again, nailing it right to the floor. Of course, he did it in a very humble and gentle way, much more humble and gentle than I'm even talking now. Extremely humble and gentle. He, he was female and male together. I mean, he was a man, but you know what I'm saying is that his manners were so soft and gentle. But yet, as I'm trying to share with you now, extremely confrontational, very male. And then when the Pharisees were telling him, well, this, he, he, he's, uh, all this power he has is from the devil, right? I mean, there, there's never end to any excuse to try to discredit. <laughs> he says, well, how can de the devil drive out the devil? They had no answer for that. Elsewhere, Jesus' authority is questioned, and he openly confronts the Pharisees, telling them, I am the Son of God. Nothing subtle. Nothing subtle. We like to think that Jesus was subtle. He wasn't subtle at all. He does say to us gently and humbly, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock, waiting for you to open the door. He has several faces that he shows us, depending on where we are. To the self-righteous, tremendous condemnation. The seven woes of the Pharisees. He cleansed the temple. Very disruptive. Very disruptive. Throwing out all the people that he called thieves. And then, in gentleness to us, the sinners, the Mary Magdalene's, the Zacchaeus's, the Peter's, he said so kindly and gently, I am the way, the truth, and the life even though he was saying it so sweetly and gently, and come to me, come to me. That was an astonishing claim, an astonishing claim. What about John chapter 14, verse 12? Read it later. Can't read all these things now, but I'll share with you the essence. Do we really believe this? I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. I'm not sure very many of us here this morning have really reconciled that astonishing claim that Jesus has on your and my life as a prediction of what we will do under the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. There are many claims. These are just a few. But to give the picture that Jesus is not timid. No timidity with Jesus. When we pray the prayer, Lord, make me like Jesus, it's a very big subject. Maybe we need to say, Lord, make me, as I would pray, Make me more gentle, less words, more soft. Maybe others, as a friend of mine in the United States, an African-American friend of mine, I love him. I, I moved to tears just recounting. You wouldn't even know why. But he said something very important. We all have to die in different ways. To the timid, he wants us to be more bold. To the bold, he wants us to be more timid. To the bashful, more assertive. To the assertive, Take a back seat. We all need to die to self in different ways. But again, just emphasizing, Jesus was very bold in the claims that he made as the Son of God. He predicted that he was going to die at least five different times in Scripture. He predicted he was going to die. He would be in the grave for three days, and he would be resurrected. Now, all of his miracles before, he said, just believe, just based on the miracles and the work that I've done, not just miracles only, but the work that I've done, helping the poor, showing attention to the sinners, the woman at the well, cornerstone of what Jesus means to humanity. But then, to cap it off, as he enters Jerusalem as a king and doesn't try to take advantage of that and then becomes crucified, 
the grave is then empty. Confirmed historically by multiple, multiple people that he appeared to after his, resurrec after his resurrection. So many promises that he's given, but these are just evidences, evidences that Jesus Christ was God's Son, God himself, divine. There are many prophets, many good men, many modern day Christians that have had amazing influence on other humans. Only one has come to this planet in the flesh, divine, God, and that's Jesus Christ. Again, we accept that, but let us not take it for granted. As radical as his behavior was within his own culture, no sensitivity to other people's thoughts as far as the skepticism in the, in the Jewish culture. He makes the same claim on your life today. I have redeemed the entire human race. They may not have salvation yet, but they have been redeemed. To those of us who want to walk in the Spirit and have the Holy Spirit in our heart, I hope it jars us. I hope it causes us great fear to know that Jesus has redeemed every human being. And my responsibility to order my life in accordance with that and not judge anyone. And to have the same caution. I can only take a few little slices. I can't give a complete picture. But just a few slices here. When Jesus was resurrecting Moses, Jesus' own biological brother, Jude, wrote this. It's so touching to me personally. As Jesus was resurrecting Moses to take him to heaven, the devil says you can't have him. Look at the standard of conduct Jesus demonstrated. The Bible tells us he did not dare to cast a slanderous accusation even against the devil. Amazing words. He didn't dare to go over that line. Do we have that same concern in our lives as to the requirements of Jesus Christ on our life? He's boldly telling us, you are mine. I have redeemed you. I stand at the door. Revelation 4.20 I stand at the 320, sorry. I stand at the door and knock. Please open. Please let me come in. As radical as the claims that I made on my life on this planet, that is how radical I want to change your life. And I will. If I had that much courage to come to this planet and give up heaven, and to live the life to redeem you. Should we decide to believe him or not and take him at his word? He wants us to have faith in him. He wants us to put our hope in him. Faith, hope, and love. He wants us to love him. It is very difficult to put into human words the lengths at what Jesus went to, the radical claims that he has made on your life and mine. But he has, and it's clearly here in his word, by God's grace, may we worship him in a more deeper understanding to the amazing power, courage, assertiveness, directness, totality, 
limitlessness of his love for you and me and every single human being in existence. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, may your amazing claims to be the Son of God, to the fulfillment of Scripture, to be the way, the truth, and the life, every claim you've made, Lord, may we reverently ponder those claims and your claim on our life. May we walk humbly before each other and before you and worship you with a deeper gratitude knowing that you are the only hero that has ever existed. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.